Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, really enjoying this very excellent panel and appreciate all of you hanging around uh, for this concluding talk. I think it's a really appropriate time to have this talk because there are things going on that I hope, as Lee sort of mentioned, are going to reopen the door for us to have an opportunity to share surgical procedures with patients who have reflux disease. It's accepted now that up to about a third of these patients on long-term acid suppression medications are dissatisfied with the quality of their lives and the success of the therapy. And there's a barrage of publications showing serious concerns about the side effects and safety profile of these proton pump inhibitors, which for a long time were assumed to be extremely safe. And we'll cover the most recent of those publications in a few minutes. A couple disclosures, none of them really relevant. Well, it's been an amazing time over the last quarter of a century in the United States of America. Cancer death rates have dropped by over 25%. Our colleagues in other disorders, such as cardiovascular diseases, have shown tremendous success in reducing the mortality and complications from these diseases. Unfortunately, not so for us. This is abject failure in this disease. What's important to recognize is that in the 1950s and 1960s, this cancer basically didn't exist. This is a cancer that started in the 70s and is now the fastest increasing cancer in America. And it's a deadly cancer. Unfortunately, if you look at this cone of survival, it's down near the bottom. And that's really unfortunate. And it's time we change this paradigm because we know the cause of this cancer. Jasper Lagergan published the New England Journal of Medicine some 15 years ago now. Reflux disease causes this cancer. And we know the precursor lesions, columnar mucosa, cardiac mucosa, and subsequently Barrett's esophagus. And we can find these tissues. We have an endoscope that allows us to find these tissues. And we have therapies that can alter the natural history of the disease. So why haven't we made a difference? It's time we do make a difference. Well, this is the old natural history of reflux disease, the 1950s natural history. Squamous mucosa exposed to acid gastric reflux led to cardiac mucosa and then subsequently ulcers and strictures. That's what Norman Barrett and that's what Collis and his colleagues were treating in the 1950s and 1960s, the acid peptic complications of reflux disease. What wasn't there was intestinal metaplasia. Occasionally it was found, but it was rare. And esophageal adenocarcinoma was essentially non-existent. The new natural history of reflux disease though the post-1970s history of reflux disease is completely different. Now we have squamous mucosa going to cardiac mucosa, but instead of the acid peptic complications, we have Barrett's esophagus or intestinal metaplasia. And that can progress on the road to low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and the adenocarcinoma epidemic that we're dealing with. And gastroesophageal reflux disease and I would propose to you proton pump inhibitors are at the center of this new GERD natural history. And why do I say that? Well, this is Jasper Lagergren's latest publication. A number of years ago, he correlated reflux disease with the development of adenocarcinoma. And in that New England Journal paper, he even said that if you're taking proton pump inhibitors, you are more likely to have esophageal adenocarcinoma. Well, it made sense because who takes proton pump inhibitors, people with reflux disease. So we assumed that it was co-founding and the reflux disease was the cause. His latest paper shows, in fact, it's not co-founding. Proton pump inhibitors themselves are linked with esophageal adenocarcinoma. If you haven't read it, get it and read it. And your patients need to see this too. Unfortunately, with this barrage of material and now with this latest publication, I think our gastroenterology colleagues are feeling more and more helpless with this disease. 
And as a consequence, when you don't have a therapy, you tend to ignore it. When you can't help a patient, you tend to just pass them off. So it's our time now as surgeons to own reflux disease. To own it, we have to understand it. And fortunately, a lot has come along in understanding the pathophysiology of the disease over the last quarter century. We understand that the squamous mucosa is converted to cardiac mucosa. That's the first transition in the reflux process, the natural history. The length of the cardiac mucosa increases as the severity of reflux increases and leads to a gradual replacement of the abdominal portion of the lower esophageal sphincter. Old publications showing very clearly the length of cardiac columnar mucosa associated with the severity of reflux disease. And Parachandasoma, our pathologist at USC for a long time, has been developing these concepts and over the last decade at our Hawaii course, he's really begun to, to bring to fruition the concept and the understanding of what's happening. There's a debate, but clearly we understand now that there should not be a very long segment of columnar mucosa between the eccentric cardiac or gastric mucosa and the normal squamous mucosa of the esophagus. It should be, if anything, limited to 1.4 millimeters. Probably in normal people, there is no interposed segment of uh, columnar mucosa. The gastric eccentric mucosa abuts the squamous mucosa. But with the development of reflux disease, the segment of cardiac mucosa increases in length. And what Pear is now showing is that that correlates with loss of the abdominal component of the lower esophageal sphincter. Two things happen. The cardiac mucosa is a very unstable mucosa. It does not tend to stay cardiac mucosa for long. It either goes in a progressive or regressive fashion to uh, accento cardiac mucosa, or it goes on to develop intestinal metaplasia and becomes Barrett's esophagus. It's always inflamed when present, which is also an indication that it's not a normal mucosa. And what Pear is proposing now, uh, and I think it has a lot of validity, is that the normal squamous uh, mucosa abuts the normal stomach with no interposed segment of columnar cardiac mucosa in the normal person. And this, in this lower portion here, crossing the diaphragm, this bar represents our lower esophageal sphincter. If we're born with about a three or perhaps in some people a four centimeter lower esophageal sphincter, the most important portion of that sphincter is the interabdominal component. And it's been nicely demonstrated if you get less than one centimeter of sphincter length, there's almost no pressure at which that sphincter can stay competent. So when you begin progressively losing length, if you get to about a one and a half or two centimeter loss of this sphincter, you're at risk of full-blown reflux because there is no pressure that the remaining sphincter can function appropriately with. So what he has shown is there is a progressive dilatation of what we perceive as the gastroesophageal junction and replacement of that distal esophagus by this columnar mucosa. And his proposition is if we measure the length of columnar mucosa, we can predict how much of the valve has been lost. And based on your age, if you're 80 and you've lost half your valve, you're probably going to make it the rest of your life without severe reflux disease. But if you're 25 and you lost half your valve already, you're probably never going to make it into your 60s without severe reflux disease. So this then becomes a way we can predict patients likely to progress towards full-on reflux disease. And we know that loss of the sphincter, and this again is old data, loss of the sphincter correlates with severity of reflux disease. Essentially, everybody in the severe categories of reflux disease, such as Barrett's, has a defective lower esophageal sphincter. So maybe we can begin intervening earlier now that we understand the factors that lead to loss of the sphincter. So if we look again at our natural history, Perhaps we intervene in these patients that have begun to develop cardiac columnar mucosa, predicting eventual loss of their sphincter function with a simple procedure, maybe the TIF, maybe the Lynx, maybe a door. Intervene before they've developed enough cardiac mucosa and lost enough lower esophageal sphincter function 
to be at risk of full-blown reflux disease. If we do that, the cardiac mucosa is likely to go back to asymptocardiac mucosa and never develop intestinal metaplasia. Well, the second step is the development of intestinal metaplasia within cardiac columnar lined esophagus. The composition of the reflux juice is likely important. There's been nice studies showing that the pH environment and the pulsed nature of the exposure all contribute to the intestinalization of this columnar mucosa. And again, it's correlated with the severity of reflux and esophageal injury. And in fact, inflammation, which we know is connected to the development of cancer, has now been connected with reflux disease. Stu Speckler has published this in several papers showing that it's not just an acid peptic injury to the squamous mucosa that's causing the changes that we observe. In fact, he's saying that it's a cytokine-mediated inflammatory process with leukocytes driving these mucosal changes and the pathogenesis of reflux disease. The end result of that cytokine-mediated inflammatory process oftentimes is the development of a columnar lined esophagus. And that data is borne out very nicely in the ProGERD data, a large multi-center study from Europe showing that if you start out with no Barrett's esophagus, but you have significant esophagitis, by two and five years down the line, you are at very significant risk of having developed intestinal metaplasia or Barrett's esophagus. Almost 10% of these patients at five years have developed Barrett's esophagus. Most gastroenterologists have a hard time believing this, but this is not new data. This, this data was shown in this early study in 2001, patients on proton pump inhibitor therapy progressively developing Barrett's esophagus over two years of endoscopic follow-up. So does surgery make a difference in this? Can we pre prevent that development of intestinal metaplasia in these patients with reflux disease? And this study from 2001 suggests exactly that. Not a single anti-reflux surgery patient developed Barrett's esophagus compared to the 19% of patients under medical therapy, proton pump inhibitors. And another study from Stefan Oberg showing that with patients with a short segment of columnar lined esophagus up to two centimeters of non-intestinalized columnar esophagus and a reflux surgery in the long term led to less development of intestinal metaplasia than acid suppression therapy. So now we think that perhaps with our interventions, the links, maybe a toupee or a Nissen, will block the progression of cardiac mucosa onto intestinal metaplasia or Barrett's esophagus. Well, what about Barrett's esophagus once we have Barrett's esophagus? Can anti-reflux surgery prevent further progression onto dysplasia? Again, old data, this is not new. This is McCollum, a gastroenterologist who was nearly thrown out of the GI societies when he published this paper, showing significant difference in the risk of dysplasia and adenocarcinoma between groups, surgery versus medical therapy. And this is a meta-analysis published about a decade ago now confirming the same thing. Incidence of adenocarcinoma 2.8 cases per 1,000 patient years for surgically treated patients compared to 6.3 cases per 1,000 patient years for medically treated patients. Anti-reflux surgery was reducing the risk of progression to dysplasia and cancer. And Jasper Lagergan himself, using the large Swedish database, which had been used in the past to, to uh, say that anti-reflux surgery was not beneficial, in fact, has completely reversed himself in this meta-analysis published two years ago. And now, he says that in patients with Barrett's, those that have anti-reflux surgery had significantly reduced risk of esophageal cancer compared to those on medical therapy. And this incident ratio of 0.26 is dramatically reduced. That's not a minor reduction, that's a massive reduction. So now we can understand that, yes, we can intervene in when you have Barrett's esophagus and a fundoplication, probably a Nissen fundoplication, because again, when you have Barrett's esophagus, essentially all of these patients have a defective lower esophageal sphincter. You just heard Brian Louie very nicely say, the Lynx is not a great option when you've got a defective lower esophageal sphincter. 
So here we're focusing in on a Nissen fund application to stop this progression. Well, what about once we have low-grade dysplasia? Is game over? Will a Nissen block progression from low-grade to high-grade dysplasia? Or can it, in fact, reverse the entire process? And the data suggests that that's exactly what happens. Multiple studies demonstrating regression of low-grade dysplasia following an anti-reflux operation. Studies from other centers, but this is USC data, two separate studies showing loss of intestinal metaplasia, particularly in short segment Barrett's esophagus, or the intestinal metaplasia of the cardia, the ultra short segments of Barrett's, where the majority of intestinal metaplasia disappears following a fundoplication. Brent Oschlager's data from University of Washington demonstrating the exact same thing, the reversal, low grade, no dysplasia, no intestinal metaplasia. In fact, it's the expected outcome. 56% of patients after a fundoplication regressed to no intestinal metaplasia. So multiple studies, multiple centers showing we can actually reverse the natural history with a fundoplication. And the meta-analysis, probability of any type of regression, 15.4% in surgically treated patients compared to 1.9% under medical therapy, highly significantly different. What about persistent dysplasia, progression to adenocarcinoma? Well, here we're talking about endoscopic therapies to eradicate it. We know that once you get to high-grade dysplasia or the dysplasia is persistent after a fundoplication, those patients should get ablated and resected. And that continues until all the intestinal metaplasia is eradicated, but then we need to apply effective anti-reflux control so they, they don't regenerate the Barrett's. And Brian Louis has looked at this, but I think a fund application is very important in this subgroup of patients as well. So this is our unfortunate reality today. And I put out a call to all of you surgeons who are for good surgeons and want to take this on. Let's change this paradigm together. This and fund application works. Augments the lower esophageal sphincter, fixes the hernia, improves gastric emptying, stops the reflux of gastric juice onto that mucosa, changes and protects that mucosa from further progression, even induces regression of these changes. And of course, it restores quality of life. So what are we waiting for? Let's get on this. One word of caution, be careful, all right? Select your patients with Barrett's carefully. I'm not advocating every patient with Barrett's gets a fund application. A failed fund application in these patients is probably worse than no fund application at all. So if you got a patient with horrible motility and a 10 centimeter hernia, and the chances that you're gonna fix that well and keep it fixed are low, don't do it. This paper, by, again, by Jasper Lagergan, very clearly points out adenocarcinoma occurring after failed anti-reflux surgery is a serious concern. And one of the highest risk factors you can give a patient that has Barrett's to go on to cancer is a failed fund application. So pick your patients carefully. In conclusion, it's time, I think, for a new paradigm to change the outcome on our GERD patients. We've been losing this battle and it's time to change. Dissatisfaction with symptom control, concerns regarding PPIs, and now evidence, in fact, that PPIs promote probably the development of Barrett's. I don't think they cause cancer. I think they cause Barrett's. And Barrett's turns to cancer. It's our time to change this paradigm. We need to pay attention to the GE junction. The gastroenterologists have lost interest. Their new AGA guidelines are don't even biopsy one centimeter of columnar lined esophagus. Treat that as normal. That's absurd. We need to take control of the GE junction, use new technologies to find intestinal metaplasia, find cardiac mucosa, predict patients at risk of progression, and give them a therapy that offers a change in the natural history. We have multiple inter levels where we can intervene. We have multiple tools to intervene. Let's start using those. To impact this disease, though, our interventions must be reliable, must be durable, and must be well done. So choose your patients carefully and do it well. Thank you.